All right, welcome everybody to the February 9th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, you've all been on this call before, two things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. So as far as announcements today, we have uh, the standard Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please leave a comment on the uh, newsletter wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Um, the second announcement that we have, you may have seen this uh, showing up on some of your socials, but Hyperledger is the winner of the 2023 Debbie's Award for the best innovation in blockchain cryptocurrency of Web3. Um, I understand that we have Bobby to thank for this, uh, for nominating Hyperledger. So um, congratulations to everybody on this award. All right, and then the last announcement that is on the agenda here is the Hyperledger Mentorship Program has been kicked off. Uh, so that we're currently looking for mentorship project proposals to be submitted. If you do have something that you would like to propose, please do so by March 15th. Any other announcements that anybody has or would like to make? All right, I will take that as a no. Um, so for quarterly reports, I did see a number of people uh, reviewing reports this morning on GitHub. There's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of comments happening on these uh, different reports that have come in. We still do have people who are outstanding as far as the reviews for both of these reports. So we will continue to leave them in an open state. Um, I did not specifically see anything that we need to discuss on the TOC call, but is there anything um, that anybody has to bring up on the Indy or the non credge report at this point? Okay. And then as far as the sawtooth report, I think we have eight of the 11 people who've reviewed that one uh, that came in uh, a couple weeks ago or maybe last week, uh, please, if you haven't had a chance to review that yet, please do so. We'll again, wait until everybody clicks on the approve or has a chance to review that for us to merge that into the, uh, into the repo. Yeah, Stephen. Um, so there has been um, on the URSA report, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that um, there has been activity in URSA in the last, couple of days, the last couple of weeks. And so um, I've asked Brett Zundel, who's been doing some of the updates to put in the report. So I'm hoping that we'll get that soon. So he has some guidance on how to do it and hopefully we'll provide it soon. All right, I appreciate the update on that, Stephen. I did see that as well, the chat going on yeah. there in yeah. the URSA channel. So, but I appreciate you bringing that up here. I think it's important as we kick this project back up uh, for us to, to start, you know, at least understanding what's going on there. So appreciate that. Any other comments on the, the quarterly reports at this point? All right, as you probably noticed, there was a fourth report there. Iroha did uh, submit the report yesterday. It is not linked here, but it will be linked for next week's agenda since it was due today. Um, we'll make sure that gets out there so that if you haven't had a chance to, to take a look at that, you'll at least remember to do that based on the agenda. And then we do have the bevel report that comes due next week. So we'll look forward to seeing that hopefully sometime next week. Yes or no? Yes, hi. Um, I had a I had a very practical question on the mm -hmm. uh, on the reports. Managing the reports um, and GitHub. So, I mean, one thing that I liked in the wiki is I could go to the task I had and I could see which one I had not reviewed yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rai, do you know any magic query that uh, 
I can use to see which one I haven't reviewed yet. Yeah, or no, the link that's in the agenda will actually pull up the ones that you haven't reviewed. Ah. Um, so yeah. if you've reviewed them already, they won't show up in this list. If you haven't reviewed them, they will show up in this list. Thank you. I didn't realize that was the link in there. So I would just go to pull requests and I'm like, oh, shoot, which one I have seen? <laughs> oh. When yeah, you do yeah, it for sure. several I... days, it's not obvious to remember. So the trick is to go back to the link. Thank you. You won't, you won't find anything for that name because there is nobody with that name. But yeah, anyway, um, the that link, I tried to, to mimic what I had in the other agenda where we had it on the wiki where you could see like your outstanding task. Uh, I tried to do that for the outstanding quarterly report. So there's a few things that I'm doing or I noticed what I did on one of the reports is uh, I'm adding the quarterly report label to them so that we know their quarterly reports. I'm also making sure that we add all 11 POC members, unless of course they submit it, the PR, uh, to the reviewer list so that each of you should get an individual email for each of them saying that you've been added as a reviewer for them, assuming that you are subscribed to receive the emails from GitHub. So um, hoping that will help people to recognize that they have outstanding tasks for themselves to do. That is great, thank you. I'm, I'm yeah. also trying to figure out a way to make these, uh, to have embedded in the uh, template, the label. So I know it's possible. I just haven't figured out how to get it to work yet. And, uh, I did add a code owner's file, which has everyone listed individually. My hope is that that the next PR comes in will will be given to everyone individually to review. All right, we will keep you informed of that ride, see whether or not that happens. Thank you for trying to make it as easy as possible on us all. <laughs> all right, any other comments? Uh, tactical or, or on the reports themselves. Yeah, Peter. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Sorry I was away for long. I, I had a lot of travel doing. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is what I put in the chat, which is that there's this uh, pull request merge key feature coming out from GitHub, and I think everyone should check it out because it will drive efficiency of the CI pipelines that all the projects have. Basically what it does is that it orders the pull requests into a stack and then the CI and the tests and the build, everything within the CI, all the checks can be executed against a revision of that pull request that it will have at the time of its merging, which can be known if there is a queue or stack structure, queue, I guess, not stack, sorry. Because that way you can always compute what other pull requests will be merged before your own. And then the source code revision can be figured out that will be the final revision that will be merged onto the project's main branch. And so instead of having to run the CI uh, n times because of other pull requests getting merged before yours, uh, the number of times you have to run the CI will be just the one as long as you have a place in the queue. I don't know how clearly I explained this, but uh, the bottom line is that it's more efficient and I highly recommend using it when it becomes generally available. I will definitely use it in its current state in the public beta because I'm really curious about it and I'm very excited about it. Uh, that's it, thank you. So for those that have been with us for a while, this is a uh, Garrett functionality where you would have a bunch of changes in a stack and then you would merge the the parent one and then everything would happen. Uh, so if you own, or if you are an admin, the setting is in your repo settings, uh, branch protection. If you have any questions, please ask on Discord. 
and I would be happy to enable this for everyone. I also, uh, I mentioned this in the maintainers channel. I turned on for the entire org, the uh, private uh, security disclosure feature. So if you get any disclosures and you're surprised by that, please get in contact. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rai, for bringing our attention to some new features. Um, good news for, for us as maintainers of projects. Any other comments at this point? All right, so I think for discussion, we didn't have any specific topics for the TOC to discuss today as a whole, um, but we do have, as we discussed last week, the beginning of the uh, round robin for the different task forces. And so we've got first up the security vulnerability disclosure task force um, that uh, we will be discussing today, unless anybody else has a discussion item before we get to the, the task force discussion. Okay, then I think we are up to the task force discussion. So Arun, uh, I know you have volunteered to be the leader for this particular task force. Do you want to I don't know, walk us through kind of what the, the this task force is all about and what the plans are for how we approach this particular work item. Right. Thanks, Tracy. And hey, everyone. And um, so, so before I begin, right, so some disclosures. So previously, when we had security update task force um, was proposed um, early last year, the um, the what we lacked over there is to scope it down into specific activities that or specific expectations that we wanted out of it i mean sure we started with some agenda and it eventually evolved into security being a wide domain the discussion spread all over from uh, having a threat modeling for a specific project and all the way it, it's definitely started with vulnerability disclosure topic and eventually it landed up to the topic where how do we do a threat modeling of a project and which parameter should we consider? And eventually it also led into discussions into how do we tackle if a project is unable to deal with a high severe, uh, I mean, high or severe issues that were reported. And what's the process that we should set up in terms of um, um, addressing these? And like, do we need a formal way of announcing to every, every graduated project that there is a process at Hyperledger and then this is that process? and follow these guidelines, right? So as you can understand, the discussions went all over the place. Now, one of the topic uh, that that we had to address or that we could have started with is of course, on the vulnerability disclosure, right? Um, so to give a background of what this, all of, what this is all about, right now today in all the projects, we do have uh, security, um, MD file, markdown file that we add into our repositories in terms of um, letting people know that if they have any concerns which they would like to discuss in terms of security, we are telling them, hey, be a responsible citizen and then come follow these process that we have. Either send an email to the security mailing list that goes to a bunch of people or report it in a way um, and uh, that uh, in, a, in a responsible way that you still um, track it for completion or you still follow up with the maintainers of the project, right? There was a way of communication. Now, is this sufficient or is like, th this probably is not a sufficient model in terms of how we uh, go about in any vulnerability disclosures, right? And that's where the discussion started and how we even start, how do we even uh, standardize the process across all the projects? And at the same time, OpenSSF had the working group, which started put, putting down a collective information that they could get across all the different open source initiatives. And they created a bunch of checklist and, and a playbook for how a vulnerability disclosure can be addressed or how it can be treated by uh, the maintainers of each project. 
so that's that's the brief brief background of what this uh, topic is all about and specifically in this task force that we have for now we will scope it down to what it is uh, meant to do in the sense uh, we will try to address how a vulnerability disclosure would happen and what actions would a particular maintainer have and what actions would the project overall have and what's the responsibility uh, that we hold from within hyperledger and what's the like all these questions that we try to address and um, as a starting point we do have a, a, a reference that is recommended from the open ssf so um, there was a call and and if you were part of the previous task force um, where we went over each of these items and I remember like having discussions where Hart proposed that some of the, um, um, uh, let's say the contending things, right? Some of the subjective terms, which are part of OpenSSF recommendation, we keep them away, but we try to see if the rest of those recommendations from OpenSSF are a good point to get started with. And probably as part of this task force, we'll, we'll try to start from there and, and we'll definitely start from there. And what we will do eventually is to like address as part of these discussions whatever questions that come up right and then we will selectively pick those subjective terms but our goal should be to have a vulnerability disclosure um, approach for all hyperledger projects and one thing that we will intentionally try to keep away for now is I know like uh, there were also discussions from the previous task force where we were debating on should we have additional questions that would gauge severity of a bug or a defect that was reported in terms of security um, 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 relevance right and if we were to gauge those then should we introduce the questions that are like blockchain threat modeling specific so we will try to keep those questions away in our task force and that could be like an extended task force or an next task force from within the security uh, scope that we can pick up so with the, um, the the limited scope and a set agenda or a set expectation from the task force we could get started um, before i start sharing the screen and and, um, and go through the open ssf uh, recommendations that we had previously discussed any do we have any questions on the scope the uh, topic or the background yes Tracy. yeah my question is uh i saw in the chat that was set up for this task force uh hearts thought on creating a template uh, that would be used by all the hyperledger projects and then only changed if for some reason it, it felt necessary. Is that part of the scope of this as well? Um, sh sure. Um, I think the template, so hard correct me if I'm wrong here. So I think by template, you wanted to say that the, um, the disclosures, I mean, did you want to introduce uh, the, the reporting template or did you mean uh, uh, like a template that we give give out as a as a way to tell community that this is the way that you should report vulnerabilities to us uh, I believe it was the latter I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's in line with what you're saying so maybe using template was just a poor word choice by me so if I may interject I mean I think you know the idea is we develop the policy because the thing that Hart pointed out, right, is that in the documentation provided by OpenSSF, they go, it's pretty extensive in terms of what you expect it to do. But at the end of the day, they don't put it all together into a document. They say, hey, and by the way, you must document all of, you know, this stuff on your website, part of your repository. And so we have to do that. Hart said, how come they don't provide a template so that we, you know, we could already start from that? And so I think Hart is right. His idea was basically 
once we have developed our own policy following the recommendations, we can then submit this to be basically a template for others to use and maybe OpenSF could leverage that and you know, publish it. Did I get that right hot? Yeah, absolutely. That was perfect. <clears throat> I mean, I do wish the OpenSSF had a better starting point. Uh, and I think if we if we do this work, then yeah, I think we can contribute it back. They have expressed interest in this, so. Yeah, I mean, just just to comment, I like the, the phrasing of templates and I think we could think about templates in other cases. I know we have the inactivity policy, right? That we've put together that, uh, that projects can somewhat override if they need to, right? Based on what it is that they're doing. Um, but if projects don't have this documented, then this is this is the default, and this is what you're going to end up using as the the mechanism. I I think this falls in line with a lot of other things that we should probably think about for our projects. So I'm I'm perfectly happy with direction. I just wanted to to make sure that we we had that in mind as we were going through. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I do think this is in scope, absolutely. So, um, okay, um, uh, so what I'll probably do, I don't know how to take notes at the same time on screen shared so i'll probably take notes on a separate notebook that i have and later i'll attach those notes to the meeting minutes um so so to get started right um so it, one of the repository that hart had put in the chart and the under the task force uh, chart group is it has extensive information as are not pointed out right so it has everything from what should an open source maintainer do or a community do in terms of setting up a process as well as it has information on what should you um, do if you have discovered a vulnerability and what's your responsibility uh, to participate in the open source collaboration uh, from an individual or a researcher's perspective and what kind of uh, recommendations that we have for you in order to get better response from the maintainers right so they they're both um, 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 topics over here and what we will focus on to get started with is on the process that we have to set up and eventually all the discussions that lead uh, lead from i mean that evolves from these conversations we will convert them into a template that we were discussing some time back. So uh, the process that we are going to discuss right now is in terms of what OpenSSF recommends for our, uh, setting up a process being an open source community. So um, the guide, the guide um, starts with all the information such as why should we need a process like this right and what's the information that the security researcher or a user of a project would be expecting from us and then how how should we make it available for them right all of that information in the introductory section um So how do we go about it? Like I remember in the previous task force meetings, we went through uh, different sections of uh, paragraphs and then we debated on each of them. Should we follow the same approach in this call as well? I think it's up to you, Arun. <laughs> right, I find that um, useful so that uh, we we could debate on the topic and then we could finalize on the things that we all agree upon then and there. And then, I mean, it also reminds us in future that we did have a discussion on some topics like that. 
so um, initial section of this document it all talks about um, what's the what does I mean the the glossary and other things right so what I will get started with would be um, right I think some of these explanation are all towards what's an expectation from a reporter that they would recognize they would want a recognition or probably they would they are expecting a fix because they have it in their production and um, and and all of that aspect so i would suggest that we also incorporate if possible this kind of information somewhere in our documentation maybe as a central at the central place saying that we care about security and um, the we could give this as advisory notice saying that this is your role as a reporter right so somebody who walks in and then says that hey hyperledger i found an issue but like how do i go about it what's my right and how do you want me to report it so probably we should list uh, these kind of um, responsibilities and then give that importance to the security researcher i know not all of that information can be found on this page some of this can also be captured from the other place such as this one which is all about uh, guidance for the researchers on what that secu um, what that means for them to report uh, uh, disclosures right so i recommend i mean i would um, propose i mean to have this section documented in a central place yeah i would if i may interject here i mean the idea behind this is that you know they they wanted to try to point out the motivations of the reporter and there are different kinds of them right uh there are people that's all they do they are like security researchers they focus on one software today another one tomorrow and they look for vulnerabilities to report and you know but they, they, there is a big range they are just simple users will find stuff they stumble upon stuff and and so the the whole point of this section really is about trying to establish a, you know some kind of understanding of who you're dealing with so that you know basically trying to defuse any possible tension <laughs> and avoid conflict trying to establish some communication with the reporter and you know acknowledge what they are providing unfortunately i think there are quite a few cases where that relationship is pretty bad in general which is why there is this other report you just pointed to that was then published later on which was also to try to tell the reporters hey guys maybe you should know a little bit more about how you know what it's like to be on the other side when you approach projects open source projects specifically you know with your reports and it's all about trying to you know help with the communication establishing a, a positive communication between those different parties go ahead tracy yeah, I guess my question is, how do we distinguish between what we're trying to do and what's already available? Um, so what I'm what I'm hearing is there's already documentation about information around the finders, who they are, what their motivations are. There's information to the finders about why and how they should report open source security vulnerabilities. And, and so my question is like, I don't want to recreate what's already existing in OpenSSF. I want to add to that and make it valuable for Hyperledger. And so I want to want to see if we can understand better where the the lines are between what OpenSSF has and what we're trying to do in this task force. Um, hot. Yeah. So that's a great question, Tracy. Um, so what I view the OpenSSF as having done is sort of come up with a, you know, very broad commentary, you know, set of best practices, set of suggestions, all about stuff on what you sort of, sort of should do for a good vulnerability disclosure program. Um, but, 
you know, my perspective is this is sort of, it's sort of people who already know what they're talking about writing stuff down. And it's not as useful if you're a new project or if you're a project that maybe isn't as familiar with security uh, to try to, you know, actually figure out a, a consistent set of, of rules and policy and what should be done. So what I'd like to see is, is something that's much more user friendly. So hence a template. So something that people could just take and apply and say, as a project, we are going to do X. These are the rules we're going to follow, right? And, you know, have this, you know, there can be some customization and, and so forth, but basically, you know, have a set of rules that, that people who aren't as familiar with this sort of thing and who, you know, haven't done it before can just follow, follow and essentially be, you know, in the good zone, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, I would have thought that the OpenSSF would have done this, but, you know, it doesn't appear that they have this. So that that's my thought, and I hope that makes sense. So I guess the, the question is, to me, rules mean here's some things that you should follow, right? Um, versus here's some background information that you should know before you follow these rules. To me, the background information before you follow these rules are already documented here in OpenSSF um, versus the rules aren't documented well enough for us to be able to just go ahead and implement. And so I want to make sure that that is the line that we're drawing of the background information is here. Go read that if you want background information. Here's the rules for the project to follow. That's what this is focused on. Uh, that's exactly right. So here, the, the OpenSSF documentation how, tells you what you should think about when you're generate when you're building a policy, right? And, and that's sort of what I, you're referring to as the background, but it doesn't, you know, give you a policy. It doesn't say do this, right? And, and we just sort of want a bare bones document that says do this and this and this. I, I completely agree with Hot, and I don't think we should duplicate this content. I, we should have a pointer for people to read as background. Uh, I, I think that's, I, I think as Hot says, what we want to do is really have a kind of a, a roadbook for how a project handles security disclosures. So this is, you know, in our project, we're doing this, uh, securities are reported there. Once we receive the security, the, the clock start ticking. This is what we do next. And this is what we do next and so on. Thanks. Makes sense to me. Yeah, I agree. Right. So to summarize like the recommendation is that we still point everybody to a document that is put up by the open SSF, but then say, hey, here is a, a, a state transition, some similar to what we had for a project life cycle, right? So this is the process that we are going to follow. And this is, these are the approximate timelines that you may be waiting in these phases. And for us, when you reference this document, these are the resources where you can do certain things. Because OpenSSF blindly talks about all the available options out there in public. Right. Um, so with that, is one thing that I would probably skip as part of this discussion, and, and probably that's also because that um, um, it, it is like a debatable topic, right? So pro we'll we'll start the discussion on that, but depending on based on the feedback that we receive on this call, we'll try to see if we need to include this in our first uh, uh, phase or maybe take this up as a latest task. So one of the recommendations from uh, OpenSSF is around having a vulnerability management team, right? So let's review the current process that we have. 
and in the current process there is high reliance on the staff right so um, somebody in the staff or maybe somebody on the security mailing list should notify the corresponding maintainers and a maintainer should go and review a reported issue and if they feel to the satisfaction that the reported issue indeed is in is something that needs to be addressed and it poses a threat then uh, like there is that intake that we can consider a project uh, i mean uh, that particular project can consider that issue as a reported issue otherwise uh, there is a possibility that the maintainer whoever has analyzed the issue um, going into a discussion phase with the reporter or the other aspect that can happen is that they will uh, say that hey this is not a security issue as you point out to be this is basically our design that we have or a design assumption that we have in the project and in our assumption we do not consider these scenarios right so there are these different possibilities that may occur now um, in terms of playbook or in terms of different phases that we will have to handle i know having a central uh, 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 team that will be a single point for all the projects uh, may be too much for that particular team who's trying to handle it right the um, some of the recommendations previously that came up in the previous task force is to have a representation from each of the graduated project if they're graduating from labs or if they're entering into incubating under hyperledger they would they would need to have a representation into a team and each of that um, the the person either should delegate when a issue is reported against their project or they themselves are responsible or accountable for uh, following up on that right i know i brought up a bunch of topic here but i'll take a pause and then open up for comments I'm yeah not... so arun if i may uh, so i think this is where it starts getting interesting and where we have to define the policy for this uh, for our foundation and I, I think you know i would set some rule that says every project must have identified you know named a person to be at least one right to to be the the vulnerability management team for that project i think that should be a condition to be within hyperledger quite frankly thanks so tracy yeah i think we have that i think that was one of the things that came out of the um out of the security task force last year I can't remember if that we added it for only graduated projects or if we added it for incubation, but I remember adding it to one of our documents under the toc.hutherledger.org. Um, so I'm trying to find that, Arno, but I, I think. Um, okay, I mean, we may have that indeed somewhere, but I'd be curious to hear from Rai because I think I remember Rai saying we, that there are very few people listening. Right, so, so, so I think the one of the topic that came up was a, a project maintainer who was on vacation, um, and a delayed response to somebody who reported an issue. So, without taking names, I guess we need Hart is recommending that those scenarios, like even though it's not intentional, could happen, right, in open source setup. So, yeah. uh, Hart suggests that we have multiple people. Yeah, not. So maybe the policy should be that we should have at least two people per project. At least. Um, so since so since nobody is raising hands, so adding on to the, the suggestion, so since we are talking about the security um, uh, uh, topic here, I propose that we also uh, we make this process mandatory for all projects, irrespective of whether they are graduated or or not it, right? So if they are incubating under hyperledger, if they are becoming a top level project, 
they are they are uh, required to have this in place is Tracy yeah I'd love to hear some of the maintainers on the call uh, what their thoughts are on whether or not they would have three people that they will as, as Hart has suggested in the, the TOC chat, uh, whether or not they have three people that they could actually nominate to be on the security team, regardless of whether your project is in incubation or graduating. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's fine to have three people if you have, uh, if three people are up and willing to do that. But uh, I think even if you have just one person, it can be uh, uh, their job to delegate to somebody else if they go on vacation. So all we need is one person who is in charge of uh, receiving notifications and then figuring out what to do. Thanks, Rama. David? Yeah, I was going to say two or more would be a good policy per project, whether it's incubation or if graduated. Thanks, David. Hi, Jim. Yeah, I think uh, I agree, uh, at least two. Uh, we should also make it really clear in a concise manner when we uh, announce this policy, uh, what are the expected activities on this uh, VMT team? Uh, I, I believe it's mainly um, monitoring uh, the incoming requests. So, which means this team is there's no like regular activities of this team most of the time, unless there is a report. Um, that's when they kick into action. We just need to make that really clear. So the teams don't think this is yet another um, you know, burden on their shoulders on a day-to-day -day basis. I agree. Um, um, yeah, sorry, just Steven. Um, the only caveat to that is when someone is appointed or or however the team manages it, they do have to um, understand what their role is. Um, you know, they've got to go through the policies, they've got to understand, they've got to understand the pass off and things like that. I think that's the only, while it's not a active until needed, um, there are some prerequisite learnings that are have, have to be done. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I assume there's going to be some, uh, at least some minimal trainings with um, either self-reading uh, material packages or a training session for uh, for the volunteers or people who got volunteered. Um, have we talked about monitoring CVE reports on dependencies? Would that be something that each team do? themselves uh each each project is expected to do themselves or this is something that the i don't know if that's the vmt team or that uh, uh, or if that's a different different team within high pleasure that does that good question um uh, so i would say that that goes down to best practices in in pipelines and things like that. Like that's more of a project best practices and and particular where Hyperledger can really help, I think, is in tooling and making sure people are aware of the tools available and things like that. We're constantly, or, or not constantly, but um, having new approaches come up that we're discovering as a project and would be, I think, valuable to other projects across the way. So again, that leads to that pipeline best practices. Yeah, yeah, I think there are some, some uh, sort of uh, um, blurring the line between the two. Um, supposedly each project should be on top of these things, right? Uh, for example, if you're, JavaScript uh, code base NPM does really good reports of these um, uh, vulnerabilities in different uh, severity levels. 
having a pipeline that at least looks looks for um, critical issues would be a good thing and fail to build. Uh, and I don't know if that exists for other other languages. Um, but there are going to be escapes, and they will turn into reports on the project themselves. Uh, I think Farfly have, have had at least one on Java. So it ended up being a report uh, on the project if we didn't address them um, soon enough. And that can be costly to the VMT team, uh, can be costly to the foundation because they may expect uh, a, a payout because they reported this. So I don't know if there, there are more things that uh, the foundation or the security task force can can think about so we can uh, encourage the team or we can help the team to stay on top of this. Yeah, I do agree. This is um, more of a project best practice thing. Thanks, Jim, for, and thanks, Stephen, for bringing the topic. So in fact, yesterday, uh, for the first time, I attended the OpenSSF uh, the working group call on the vulnerability disclosures. And what I learned, uh, at least from that call, is there is another working group, or at least there is a project within OpenSSF that is working towards uh, this question that you brought up in terms of how do we address a dependency CVs uh, within the project, right? Or if there is a way of automatically taking care of fixing them. In identifying and then figuring out the dependency versions and upgrading them. Um, I guess some of the objectionable questions that were raised in that meeting were would the project maintainers be happy with those automated CR, uh, PRs and to what extent should that be taken care? But yes, that's a valid question. And in these discussions, um, I think. And if I were to summarize last uh, two, three minutes, probably last five minutes of conversation, um, and probably bring up a few questions that are still unclear is in terms of uh, when we spoke about VMT, I guess, um, I forgot who brought it up, but I think Jim, it was you asking for trainings to the VMT, right? In terms of like, what they should be doing. A similar topic on the training um, is also um, what is the responsibility of a VMT apart from being a representative for the project within Hyperledger? What else would that VMT uh, be doing? Right. So there are a few thoughts in terms of what they could be doing. For instance, since they are going to know, I mean, they are the facing uh, single uh, point for the projects. They would know all the things that occur in terms of security, at least for the project. So we could propose that VMT often meet with each other and then share the learnings across to other projects as well. It may be um, obvious that in few cases, it, um, some things that we do in one of the project could be a learning to another project. Like, hey, we made this decision long back. We thought like this was, uh, this is what we assumed and we started with it, but now we face this issue. So see if you can avoid doing the same mistake that we did or probably see if you can uh, if you have such such a design in your or such a dependency in your case and see if you can uh, do a workaround immediately before somebody else will figure it out right so this is one other thing that a vmt can do um, and this will not just encourage the projects to collaborate and like know about each other but this would also bring up a in terms of security standards, uh, higher quality code across all repositories and across all the projects. And it would also encourage security researchers to um, like have these focused group conversations, join these conversations. And, um, and I mean, the responsible uh, people would also be recommending things to the group. I know it's all, um, uh, going to work out well if executed well but any thoughts on these things i think the training can be covered as part of these uh, groups where we can invite an external participation for um, expert who have expertise on these things we can have them as a guest speakers and then cover these topics 
uh, in some of these regular meetings. Um, David? I think the most important outcome here is some very clear guidance to the VMT folks. So I'm thinking like a one page guidelines document that references the open SSF stuff as background, but then is very crisp about the expectations and guidelines. I don't think we need a lot of training, extra meetings and that type of thing, but let's make sure we have at least like a very clear one pager of guidelines. Got it. So any, any other thoughts on adding uh, the additional responsibility to the VMT? So um, I don't know how to treat this response to me. Um, like all silence, does it mean what I proposed is fine or what David is talking about is fine or like which one should we follow? Hey, Peter. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I also just wanted to say that I agree with the points about not making it a huge effort as an extra effort on the maintainers. Uh, and, you know, with that the important point made, I think it's okay to add. That's it. Got you. So to also answer your question, in my case, the silence was agreement. Got you. So what we are then proposing is, yes, there would be regular interaction among VMT. It could be offline. And if needed, it could be a, a, a on demand basis, a requested call, which may be even like one call per month, right? Where we get all the VMT representatives. And sure, there will be given guidelines which for offline references to go through and then they have a clear cut crisp information available for what their expectations are from the project. But these um, additional guidelines or additional meetings would be helpful to announce our learning sharing sessions what we can call um so i'll put it up in a proposal and then we'll see if there are any oppositions or any other thoughts right offline i know we have like five minutes but the other aspect that i wanted to cover uh, like within these discussion points which is still open is in terms of when does the responsibility of VMT gets, I mean, start, right? So um, does it start immediately when an issue is reported or does it uh, start when a vulnerability is like identified to be really an issue? I mean, like what's the ticking point when we start considering the timelines, uh, the responsibility on the VMT itself start? Or what would be that initiation initiation point of how we uh, connect the dots, right? So one thing that I skipped in, in this discussion is this one, the topic of uh, how to set the policy or how to handle the expectations. Probably this will address some of the opens that I have in terms of initiation. Yes, Tracy. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, if we look at what, had been previously documented for Hyperledger. Uh, it was 48 hours to respond to the reporter, acknowledging that they had reported something, and then one week to triage, report, and coordinate with the effective project maintainers to plan the fix of the bug. So, I, I mean, those seem reasonable to me, but uh, I, you know, don't know if people think those are reasonable time frames, or if we need to extend them or shorten them. Um, one way or the other, but uh, that's what was originally documented I, in the um, issue that we have for the security vulnerability disclosure. I did include what we previously had documented for timelines, and so I think it's worthwhile for us to just review what we had, see if any of that is still applicable, and if it is, great, and if it's not, 
um, how do we need to change it? I agree, Tracy. I think we should start with what we already had. I assume that's still valid until somebody challenges it. What? Uh, so what we what is stated there, those 48 hours in the 90 days is widely considered standard and sort of the upper limit of what you should have. Um, you know, I'm comfortable if people want to bring those numbers down, particularly the 90 days. Uh, but I would say a template would have 90 days. I mean, I think the like uh, the Linux kernel has like either a week or two weeks now instead of 90 days where they basically, you know, they disclose things immediately, almost. Um, but, you know, those are, you know, those are sort of the established upper bounds. Uh, and, you know, you can still see that those are the established upper bounds if you go through the open SSF content. Right. So, um, sorry, hard to interrupt. I think the, the I, I got what you're trying to say. So what Hart is saying is with respect to when should the reported CVE uh, be disclosed, right, and in, in, in public? But Hart, I think what we were trying to cover is the like, what's the responsibility in terms of VMT team? Um, like, what's their timelines and how much time do they have to respond back and immediately when the issue is reported? So I um, did I understand you correctly, Hart? So, I, I mean, I thought it was the VMT team that was going to respond to the initial people, right? So, are we saying, but I thought like Tracy is saying one week to triage. Are we saying to change it to 90 days? You know, the, the 90 days is to fix it. So, 90 days is I to didn't, fix. I didn't, yeah, I didn't read the rest of the, the responsible disclosure piece. I was only trying to answer your question. Uh, a room which was what is the BMT responsible for initially and, and what's their timeline, um, which I thought was the 48 hours to respond and then the one week to triage. The 90 days to fix is the next one in the, the list of things that are documented. And so I think Hart was just reading the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. Sorry for the confusion there. No, no, no worries. Yeah, we would have brought this up in some time. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, um, I see we are top of the hour, but yeah, this was good discussion. We will continue these discussions offline as well. And for the items that we have discussed today, we put them in the meeting minutes and see. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, for taking that, taking us through that. Um, we will meet again next week.